into one of our earliest lessons in the design of concrete structures. In this talk, we'll focus mainly on a little bit of the history and major developments um, throughout time that have affected how concrete structures are used and developed today. Throughout time, um, concrete's come in a lot of varying forms going back many millennia through uh, into the BC era on those. Some of the earliest uses of it were by the Nabataeans and the Bedouin traders in what is now the Middle East, kind of in the, the region of Jordan and Syria and Israel. Concrete at this stage wasn't what we... Uh, considered to be modern concrete it was more of a kind of a sandy grout mixture if you will but it was very resilient and there are examples of it still you know around even to this day and on the photos you can see um kind of kind of illustrate that point it was more of like like, like a sandy mixture rather than a, a coarse aggregate cementitious material and didn't have a whole lot of design strength and it didn't have a whole lot um, didn't have any sort of metal reinforcing at that time but it started to prove prove the possibilities so those are some of our earliest known records of concrete All right follow that up you know you know in 2500 bc around that time we started getting forms of concrete even in you know the the, the egyptian civilization you know the, the pyramids while they were mostly block did have some sort of concrete coating over the uh, over the outside now again concrete is not modern concrete it's more of you know kind of almost like a grouted kind of mixture at that point but it was there it, um may not have been as resilient as we like but you know it did kind of serve the purpose of what we were looking at okay all the way up to you know the seventh century BC, um, the Chinese civilization started you know using forms of concrete type structures you know even in the in the Great Wall of Qi you know near Qingdao. Okay. The most notable contribution to the use of concrete came from the Romans though. Okay, and this was in the era of about 500 BC. You know the Pantheon in Rome, Italy is to this day is considered one of the marvels. You know, the, of the world, you know, because of its use of, you know, a very thin like shell structure that was exclusively concrete uh, based, okay, and even from a structural engineering standpoint, the structure is still very, very amazing. Um, they were known for using concrete in their, in their roadways, you know, some of which are still in use today. Um, they're known for, the, you know, the aqueducts, which again were kind of examples of, you know, masonry and concrete type construction. But again, all of this was, you know, done without any sort of reinforcing steel being applied to the structure. Okay. But, you know, when the Dark Ages came around, we found that, you know, a lot of the original recipes for the puzzle and cement were, were lost. Okay. Now, I'm not exactly sure how you actually lose a recipe for something like this. You know, and it's not like it's on a flashcard, but, you know, it. You know, the, regardless, the technology or and the use of it fell out of favor and just wasn't used, okay? But, you know, nearly a thousand years later, somehow they miraculously found manuscripts um, that kind of helped reestablish these recipes, and that kind of started to usher us into a more modern use of the material. Um, one of the earliest uses was the Eddystone Lighthouse, um, built in 1793 in Cornwall, England, um, where they developed a technique for producing hydraulic lime for cement. Okay, which is one of the major binding agents in the materials. Okay. Portland cement, which is our, our modern creation of the material, um, was developed by Joseph Aspidin in England in 1824. And when he did, made his concrete mixture using Portland cement, you know, introduced the idea of sand, which had been used before, but then also now started using, you know, a, a much larger particle size in the form of coarse aggregate, whether it's limestone or granite or, or whatever. And now, you know, in the last 200 years, we're getting into the modern era of cement as we know it. Okay. The next major milestone that happened was um, the, and the, the inclusion of reinforcing steel. And this was developed by Joseph Monnier in France in 1857 and he used reinforcing steel um, to help strengthen the concrete material now he wasn't building beams or structures he was actually doing reinforced concrete flower pots 
and so he was using steel to kind of as a wrapper to help kind of hold the particle shapes into into a unique shape to help hold it together for the stresses that were being you know, used by by the soil that it was containing as part of these flower constructions. All right. As the materials evolved, we get into the early 1900s. Eugene Freycinet um, kind of took it to a whole other level. He, for, by many people, he's considered the father of modern concrete, and especially in the area of pre-stressing. Okay, what pre-stressing does is, you know, we started getting into the development of modern steels um, around this time, and so the pre-stressing was a way of incorporating high-strength materials to help, you know, make sections more efficient, more elegant, more, you know, more compactly designed, but still being able to do the job and to hold the load. And this is where engineering really started to take off. And this slide shows a list of, you know, several of his, uh, of some of his more major innovations in the area of concrete. Um, the the, the dirigible, dirigible sheds um, from 1916 to 1920 um, used steam cured molds, okay, and so the curing process and how we harden the concrete over time and, you know, you know, techniques for doing that was, you know, developed based off of this project. Um, we started making, you know, hollow sections, you know, with uh, the St. Pierre de Vauvray arch bridge, you know, in 1919. And then he had the Villa New Orly Airport in 1923. So we started getting into what we call thin, thin shell structures. So we're really starting to push the engineering. And if you look at the time frame of this, this is all over the course of about seven years. So it started moving in leaps and bounds, thanks in a lot to the work that, to, to Eugene Freysenay, okay. And then the Plagostal Bridge uh, was built in 1930. And we actually have a photo of this one. Uh, it's over the Alorne River near Brest in France, and you can see that it's no longer very big and bulky type structures. They're engineered and they're very sleek and they're very elegant. And this is, you know, you know, you know, a very, very instrumental um, demonstration. You know, as early as 1930, so over the course of the last 90 years or so, this is, you know, where we've come. Okay. Now, concrete in the U.S. You know, while concrete is very, very popular in regions like the Middle East and in Europe. Now, you know, the U.S. was a little bit slower to actually put it to use. Um, in 1875, we had the first uh, residential use um, called Ward's Castle, built by William Ward. You can see it's kind of a kind of a unique looking architectural structure. Um, the first street was in Bell Fountain, Ohio, 1891. This road is still actually in use as of the recording of this uh, of this PowerPoint, and so, you know. Now, what really made it take off as an architectural material, though, was um, the use of it in Paris, France. And one of the earliest structures to utilize modern concrete was at the 25 Rue Franklin in 1902. And this was, all of a sudden, you start seeing a lot of, you know, it's no longer just simple beams and simple coatings and that kind of stuff. You can see they're actually starting to do architectural finishes on this structure and the structure that's here in the middle you can see some of the fine detail and the markings that really start to show the versatility of what you can do with concrete we're starting to get you know non-rectangular shapes we're starting to you know, do things that are geometrically interesting and become much more complex okay. uh, reinforced concrete though which came around in the 1870s really changed the game Okay, like I say, this kind of coincided with, uh, you know, the use of, you know, of, of cast iron and the, the development of, you know, of steel as, as an alloy of iron, you know, as an iron alloy to be used as reinforcing. Okay, um, in 1904, we had the first concrete high-rise in the U.S. This was the Ingalls Building located in Cincinnati, Ohio. This is a 16-story building, and for that time frame, this was a pretty major accomplishment for a material that was barely you know, 20, 25 years old in the U.S. as far as the technology. Okay. Now, some of the more modern marbles, you know, came a little bit later, but, you know, concrete is used in a lot of the largest structures in the world. You know, 1936, you know, we had the, the creation of the Hoover Dam, and this was one of the largest, you know, concrete projects in the world at the time. You know, it was, uh, basically this helped develop Lake Mead, which blocked off the Colorado River just outside of Las Vegas. And you know, this river, this dam, actually provides power for almost the entire southwestern United States, including Southern California. The power generated by the Hoover Dam, you know, is a significant contribution to the infrastructure in the U.S. 
and a lot of the challenges associated with the Hoover Dam. If you ever get a chance to go see this, they have a fantastic show at a museum, you know, in the Hoover Dam, and it's well worth the price of admission just to go see this, the, some of the old photos and those kind of things. I really enjoyed the visit I made there five or six years ago. Okay. Um, in 1942, a little while later, we have the Grand Coulee Dam, which was a, another you know, hydroelectric project that uh, blocked off the Columbia River up in Washington. Um, at the time, this was the largest concrete structure ever built and it contained nearly 12 million yards of concrete. That is a big, big, big dam all done out of concrete. Okay. Um, we get into some more of the uh, more iconic structures, such as the Sydney Opera House that was built in 1973. And like I say, this is, you know, for, for Australia, this is just, I mean, you think Australia, this is the image that comes to mind is the Sydney Opera House. And, you know, you can see that it's a very, you know, irregular shapes as, again, no longer rectangular beams or simple construction like that. We're now getting into very thin plated structures and, you know, curved shells at that, you know, as the technology you know, started to improve. More recently, in 2004, we have the world's largest cable stay bridge, which is in Malau. And so the Malau Viaduct, you know, is a, an extremely tall structure. And you can see the size of the concrete pylons. You know, they, they had steel cables to hold the deck bridge up, but everything else in this bridge is concrete. And so some very, very iconic structures. This is the, the, the tallest cable state bridge in the world. Okay. And then even more recently, you know, we get to the tallest structure in the world, you know, which is the Burj Khalifa. Okay, and now there are others that are being built that will surpass this height, but at the time, this is, you know, this was a major accomplishment, and the core of this structure was, you know, was, was a kind of a, 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 a Y-shaped rib that goes up the middle of the structure that allows you to have this tapered section for, you know, the tallest structure in the world. It's absolutely amazing on this. A very, very iconic and made out of concrete. Okay. Now, concrete's a little bit different from the design of steel, where steel was... A material that we could, you know, we had some fairly good understanding coming out of basic mechanics and materials principles, you know, that, you know, we treated, you know, steel and compression very similarly to we do in, in tension. Um, things are based off of yield stresses or ultimate stresses. Okay, concrete doesn't have that that issue. In fact, concrete is a, is a hybrid material, and we've talked about, you know, the aggregate and the materials associated with with making the concrete, the cement and the sand and the concrete, you know, but they also, in modern concrete structures, we include reinforcing. And so there are a lot of logistical issues. Here's a, a foundation for a, for a grain silo. And you can see that, you know, it's not just the concrete mix that makes the structure. That reinforcing steel pattern is very, very dense. And, you know, anywhere that you have a wall come in or you know, members tying into the foundation of the structure, you get some very, very significant challenges associated with the reinforcing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in this series about developmental length and anchorage and being able to develop the forces that we need in the bars. And they provide some very, very major challenges in the area of detailing. Okay, you know, because I can't, you know, if I put too much steel in one area, I can't possibly get any concrete in around it, you know, and that's a, a congestion problem. So ACI the governing body for concrete design in the U.S. Um, will, you know, have has rules for how things are placed and to, to ensure structural safety, structural adequacy, serviceability, and all those kind of issues. But we have some big, big projects, and these steel challenges become a major, major placement challenge. All right. However, you know, on the on on the on the upside is I can do some fairly amazing things just by you know changing the shape of formal work and part of this comes from the nature that concrete when it is placed is in a semi-liquid state it flows okay and so i can come up with you know very interesting architectural shapes as you saw in the you know in the 25 rue photos that we showed earlier in paris you know even this you know is a very complex system but i can come up with some very interesting shapes you see we've got some you know some architectural you know curvature type of type of structures. I have straight walls and you know I can do multi stories and, and those kind of things. Okay. The one downside to this is that placing concrete is very labor intensive where steel could be had a lot of work done that could be done in a fabrication shop. You know, you build the beam, you weld it, add the plates and the stiffeners and those stuff, you put it on the truck and then go set it up, you know, set it in place on the job site. 
concrete takes a lot more time and a lot more expense associated with form work. You know, you know, kind of as a as an estimate, a rule of thumb. You know, you know, for every dollar that you spend on placing concrete, you're going to spend a dollar on the form work itself just to set up because of the labor and the cost associated with it. So it's not an insignificant expense, but you do have some versatility. One drawback to concrete is is that because of its nature, you pour it as a as a, as, a, as a fluid material, but as we were saying, with steel, you have the ability to be able to make field modifications. You know, if something doesn't fit or you need to add on to an existing structure, you know, if you have the right material and, you know, you know a capable welder, a lot of times you can make modifications on site to a structure. Concrete doesn't have that have that luxury it's a lot more challenging to make a, an infield modification to you know a, you know a change in the use of a building to you know a change in scope to any sort of fabrication or layout error becomes a lot more significant and there are some other challenges with well how do you connect a concrete structure to you know a steel frame and so there's a whole lot of design that goes into the embedments and the connections between those it becomes a it becomes a very significant challenge for for what we're you know for for what we're trying to do, but you do you know like I say the, the pluses are that we get some very some flexibility in what we can make. We just have to make sure that we get it set up right in the process. Okay, you know, but you no, know, at the end of the day, the options are endless. I mean, I can do curved walls very very easily in in a, in a concrete structure just by changing the shape of the formwork. Okay, and providing the reinforcing that's necessary. Okay. The other issue, you know, to kind of combat this, you know, this, this idea of pre-making things in a steel in a steel fabrication environment, we can do the same thing in concrete, and so you know that's where the the evolution of you know precasting came into place, and you know we, we kind of equivalent uh, these two, you know, being like life-size Legos, you know, they're precast pieces that all the beams and the columns and stuff are made at a fabrication facility, you know, they're they're precast, and then all that we do is design the connections in such a way that we can set these as big pieces on the job site. Okay, the the photos that we have here show some 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 inverted T beams and some ash tow bridge girders that you know I can build a, a bridge girder at the at the plant at the precast plant and put it on a truck, and then I basically set it in place once the the abutments and the, the bridge supports are made out in the field. So it speeds up the construction times very you know very significantly. Um, the most common use of precasting is has to do with uh, parking garages. You know that you know we can build large, large structures. You know just using these precast items, and we can also do you know even buildings can be precast. You know in the lower right here you see you know a structure, and they've actually built a precast concrete wall panel that has openings for windows, and then, and then all we do is we insert the glass windows, and we're off to the races. Another variation that you see over on the lower left would be something like a you know, a precast structure or even a tilt-up construction where I, I pour the concrete inside and then I lift it into place, you know, as, as an approach for speeding up the construction. All right. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a taste of, you know, the, the history and the evolution of some major, you know, developments in the history of concrete, you know, and some of the people that were involved in some of the technologies. But at the end of the day, concrete is a very... You know, a versatile and robust material that's made out of sand, cement, and aggregate that is then, you know, reinforced with tensile steel. One of the problems with concrete is, that, and we'll talk about this when we get to the material discussion in the next lecture, is that concrete is not very strong when it's loaded in tension. We get cracking and, and you know, excessive deformation as a result. So we have to do something to kind of give us back that structure. I, you know, aside from arches, which is kind of the philosophy that Romans used, arches were a compressive structure. Concrete was perfect for that. Okay, we had very little consideration for tension, but you know, anytime you know, in modern structure, uh, in modern structures, and in modern construction practices, tension can't be avoided. And so we had to come in and come up with rules and guidelines for how do we design, you know, how much reinforcing we need, and where is it placed, and what are the rules so that the structure can be adequately built and can survive for for great lengths of time. So I hope this kind of helps um, establish. You know kind of some of the basics that we move forward in our design class so thank you for watching